All right. Um, I think we can go get uh, ahead and get started. Um, so uh, before I start, uh, Amy and I talked, and uh, if you'd like to ask questions, we're going to try the unmute yourself and just ask a question. If things get out of hand, uh, I might, um, uh, uh, I don't know, do some monitoring, but um, we're going to try that today. Okay, so welcome to this month's uh, talk. Uh, today we have Amy Ogan, who's going to talk to us about culturally relevant educational technology at a global scale. Um, and without further ado, Amy, you can start. Hello. Yes, as Paula said, um, feel free to uh, speak up and ask questions or put them in the chat and we'll um, deal with it at the end of the talk. Um, it's uh, interesting to still be giving remote talks two years later, but I'm so glad that so many people could join from so many different places. This is really fantastic. All right, so today I am going to be talking about culturally relevant educational technology at a global scale. Um, and I'll start off with some really good news, which is that um, overall across the world, we've had an enormous global reduction in out of school children. So many more students are getting the opportunity to attend school all around the world. Um, and this is a chart from 2013, so it has only gone up from there, but you can see across uh, Africa, South Asia, Middle East and North Africa, um, East Asia and the Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, all around the world, we've had an enormous reduction in children who were not able to attend school. Um, of course, that still comes with challenges. When we get kids to school, we're often still failing them, and even more so in low-income countries, but also in high-income countries. Um, and so you can see the percentage of, of children here who will not learn even basic uh, primary level skills. And of course, in the pandemic, we know that that situation has gotten even worse. Um, I am one of those who believe that technology can be part of a solution uh, for addressing these global challenges. Um, but uh, there are many solutions that believe in technological determinism. That is providing one-to-one -one computing devices uh, without um, making sure that they really are adapted to the place and the learners that they are attempting to serve, even after, you know, 15 years and a billion dollars of trying to just provide computers to students around the globe. Um, so uh, one of the things that we ask as we are uh, trying to um, address this problem, which is the, the uh, indiscriminate distribution of technology that doesn't actually support our learners, we might ask, are there cultural differences in teaching and learning? And if so, how do we address them in our educational technologies in ways that lead to equity uh, for the learners that we're trying to support? Uh, yes, Ken, computers are, are not necessarily different from books in that respect, as we know the cyclical nature of technologies for uh, improving education. So today I'm gonna to look at some studies that investigate these questions. And I uh, have pulled together the variety of proposals that there are for dealing with the findings uh, from those questions. And this is drawn from um, a review of 639 papers across a number of fields, uh, a set of international student and faculty interviews, flying faculty, that is faculty who go across uh, and teach in different places. Uh, but most importantly for me, uh, field work in 11 countries uh, in both schools and homes, looking at cross-sectional opportunities for learning across SES, ethnicity, gender, and a wide variety of backgrounds. And um, so you can see in this chart uh, the places where I've done my field work around the world. Always in conjunction with many local partners, uh, who deserve a great amount of the credit for the work that I'm going to show you today. 
So before we dive into any of that work, I want to just talk a little bit about representation in the learning sciences and educational technology. Um, because in the review that my students and I did uh, of uh, the meta review of a set of reviews that have looked at a number of different um, uh, venues for learning science and ed tech research, what we found was that uh, a minimum of 75% up to 93% across these various conferences and journals, uh, the learners that were represented in those studies were weird. Um, and if you haven't heard that term before, that's Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic nations where most of this research is being done. So that's as varied as educational psychology to learning sciences, to artificial intelligence and education, learning at scale and, and so on and so forth. And we also know that psychology insights that were thought to be universal don't necessarily hold in non weird uh, cultures. And similarly, learning science principles are often rooted in cultural and political practices. And so this is one of the things that I think is really important for us to address in the learning science literature, which often leads us to the insights we use in our educational technologies, is to be able to uh, understand teaching and learning conditions around the globe that may not uh, um, automatically lead us to make assumptions about what our learners know, can do, and, um, and uh, will um, motivate and support them best in their learning practice. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural influences on teaching and learning, the impact of culture in te uh, technology enhanced learning, and some proposals for uh, scaling up those technologies. So, um, Let's start with the premise that education is about communication, two-way communication, of course. Um, and if we look at education in that sense, we have a theory of semiotics that includes three levels at which communication occurs in a sociocultural context. That is syntactics, semantics, and pragmatics, uh, which vary uh, from words, symbols, and grammar up to norms, beliefs, values, and motivations. So if we start by thinking about syntactics and semantics, uh, that is the words and symbols used in communication, this is one of the places that we often start when we think about uh, internationalizing educational technology. And so you might just think first about translating it. And so I've come across many companies that think about translation as their first step for supporting um, uh, uh, for, for supporting students in, um, uh, in other countries, in other locations. And so you, you could translate into a local language. Um, in that sense, many people oftentimes have told me that uh, math is the one place that we don't have to worry about this because mathematics is a universal language which all students will understand. So if we go beyond translation, we might think about mathematics as the next place where uh, actually um, students across the globe will understand the same uh, materials. And yet um, there are really important studies that show us that mathematical symbols vary as well across language, country, application, region, and community of practice. So a quick example of this is this number which some of you are coming from around the globe. And so for some of you, this number might be less than 10, uh, at least a few of you. <laughs> and uh, for others, this might be much, much greater than 10. So that's just one little example of uh, how students might encounter the same number in an interface and come across completely confused. And this is one of the things that I saw while I was um, running field work with the same educational technology across six different uh, country locations. And so I got interested in uh, the differences that we might see in just mathematical representation. So what you see here 
Uh, on the bottom left is a very typical representation from the United States of where the divisor goes and what symbol you used for dividing in a mathematical equation. Um, there's an interesting set of, uh, of anecdotal evidence, but and also studies looking at this online. If you go search uh, for you know, how is division represented across countries, you'll see some really interesting variations. So this happens to be an example from uh, a Norwegian person who was describing the uh, division practices in America. But then on the top right, they showed what was happening in Norway, uh, which is a, a, a colon uh, with an eight. And then they said, actually, no one is using this algorithm in Norway anymore. Uh, and then we looked at representations from Spain, where you have um, a line with a dot above and below, and the uh, divisor on the right-hand side uh, instead of the left-hand side. Uh, and uh, it turns out that in Norway, this symbol actually indicates subtraction. Uh, so you would come away from this problem with a very different answer. Uh, in fact, um, it's not even the case that within a country you can uh, rely on the same representation for the same mathematical operation. So in the bottom left, uh, you see the region of Spain, Catalonia, uh, where they have the uh, dividend or divisor on the right hand side, but the mathematical symbol is kind of the uh, reverse of what you see uh, in America. And uh, when I was doing work across Latin America, so I was uh, running a study um, in uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, um, Chile, and in Brazil, uh, we saw four different examples of four different approaches to um, the symbol symbology of uh, division across countries that for the most part spoke the same language and, of, and then were in the same region. So Brazil speaking Portuguese as well. And so even when the software was attempted to be internationalized, to be translated to another um, country, so they chose one representation for the Spanish language. And what we saw was that that representation didn't work uh, in most of the places where we were running our studies. So that's mathematics, uh, which it turns out uh, is not as universal as one might think. But it's also the case that um, language also cannot just be translated from one um, uh, international version of a language to another. So a home dialect uh, is a particularly fraught uh, issue within the language communities, but also has significant impact uh, on students' abilities to engage in learning opportunities. And so uh, what we see here are studies that show that teaching students to read in their native dialect significantly increases comprehension. Um, and in fact, even where, uh, you know, someone from not from within the context might not realize it, but uh, in Germany alone, there are 250 dialects. And of course, there's a conversation we could have about uh, which is the dialect and which is the language, uh, but that's just within one country alone. Uh, and of course, you can imagine how that scales around the globe. Um, so if we move from, uh, from syntax and, uh, and dialect to uh, the next part of communication, we might think about pragmatics. That is the context, situations, motivations, norms, beliefs, and environment that underlie the use of language and cultural symbols. And so, uh, of course, you're going to guess from this talk that we find enormous differences uh, between learners here as well. And so here you see a representation from one particular study run by Iyengar et al, uh, who were looking at intrinsic motivation. And we tend to have this view uh, in more mainstream learning sciences that intrinsic motivation is really important. And so they provided learners with either a puzzle, a word puzzle that they had to solve, that they were allowed to choose which word puzzle they wanted to solve, or they gave them one that had been chosen by their family as the most important word puzzle for them to solve. And so if you were to go by the principles of intrinsic motivation, 
you would think that for all learners, personal choice would matter. So we choose the one on the right, not the one imposed on you by your family. However, they ran this study with both Anglo-Americans as well as students from Confucian heritage descent. So that is primarily in East Asia. And we're not in person, so I won't ask you guys to chime in, but you might be able to guess which of these, uh, based on uh, the fact that they found these effects in this study, which of these were actually preferred by Anglo-Americans compared to Confucian heritage cultures. So personal choice, the one predicted by the ideas of intrinsic motivation was preferred by Anglo-American learners. Uh, the family choice, the one that might feel imposed on you uh, from that weird perspective uh, was actually um, preferred by those who were from Confucian heritage cultures and also uh, affected their time on task and their performance. So they were faster and better at solving the problems that their parents had chosen for them than ones that they had chosen themselves. These impacts also uh, have uh, their um, uh, have have been seen in other features of the learning environment, things like classroom conversation. And so, um, one approach that is typical for uh, American schooling systems is that there is a teacher at the front who might encourage a lot of classroom conversation, but is often the one directing the conversation. And they call those switchboard conversations. So I might call on someone and then I'll call on someone else. And I might ask them to address the other person's comment, but I'm still as the teacher controlling that conversation. And so what uh, this study on the bottom left found from Greenbaum et al was that during these switchboard conversations, um, Native American children compared to their na non-Native American peers uh, spoke shorter utterances when they spoke individually, they spoke individually less frequently, they interrupted the teacher more and they gazed at their peers more when the teacher was speaking. However, when uh, the researchers uh, encouraged a different format of participation in the classroom, that allowed for overlapping turns. So the kids all talking together and uh, as part of a conversation. This increased Native Hawaiian students' participation, the length of their utterances, and in fact, their reading scores. Um, and so this has a really big impact on how we think about uh, learning opportunities that happen in the classroom. So uh, many other studies related to this one have shown a variety of, of differences in what we might think uh, are classical uh, conversation patterns. So um, it's observed by many that Confucian heritage culture learners have lower participation in uh, you know, American style class discussions. Uh, and there are many reasons for why this is happening. So in uh, studies showed that in Shanghai, secondary school students preferred asking questions in private rather than in class. Um, only 6% of grade eight students would ask questions during class. Uh, and other studies showed the, some of the motivations behind this. So for instance, uh, a concern that class time would be taken away by their questions. Um, other uh, indicators that social consideration for the benefit of the whole class was more important than getting their own questions answered or than by being seen as a person who contributes to class. So there's a variety of uh, ways in which a culture can impact our communication, our participation, and our other actions and behaviors that are um, so critical to taking full advantage of our learning opportunities. And then I wanna think a little bit about the impact of culture in technology enhanced learning itself. So if we think back again to syntactics and semantics, there have been some interesting projects in this space. So for instance, active math um, from Mellis et al uh, on a culturally aware mathematics educational technology uh, that you can see on the right hand side 
asks a bunch of personal information about the learner, what language they speak, where they're from, what region they're from, what field they're working in, educational level, you know, familiarity with technology and so on. And then from that information, it modifies the names, the formulas, the units to match that culture uh, in a way that, com uh, that facilitates comprehension on the part of the students. Here's another example that I think is really cool of a technology that does this as well. So it's called CRITS. Um, uh, Mohammed, who is the author of this work, also has a, a newer version called ICON, and they do some really cool things. Uh, this is a system that's primarily deployed in Trinidad and Tobago. And what it does is um, differ, uh, is, is um, vary the amount of uh, local dialect that's present in the language being used by the system. So you can see in the, both in the problem description, but also over in the hints and feedback on the right hand side of the screen, the amount of dialect that's present. And Muhammad calls this cultural density. And in the latest version, she actually allows students themselves to choose how dense they would like uh, this cultural um, information uh, to be in their own system. So that's sort of a, a way to look at mathematics, symbology, and language, even within a computer science course. Uh, and then, of course, there's the impact that pragmatics has on educational technology. So this, I think, is an interesting study um, from Kizilcek and Cohen, uh, who looked at deploying a self-regulation intervention. And again, from the learning sciences literature, we have a view that self-regulation is really important. So we need to be able to um, check ourselves, check our learning, investigate what our goals are, see if we're working towards attaining those goals or whether we're off track, and generally be highly aware of what's happening in our learning environment and whether that, uh, that process is actually supporting our own learning outcomes. And so what Kizilcek and Cohen did was uh, deploy a self-regulation intervention into a massive open online course. So you can actually see the intervention here on the right hand side, pretty simple. And what they found was that across this MOOC, which had learners from all around the globe, they were actually able to find sets of learners for whom this intervention worked and sets of learners for whom it didn't. And in particular, it worked for individual for people from uh, cultures that tend to be more individualist and not for people who tend uh, to be, who are from cultures that tend to be more collectivist. And so that very idea of self-regulation, of attaining one's own personal goals, uh, may not have been the thing that actually supported folks who weren't from those individualist cultures that um, prize individual learning outcomes above many other things. So here's an interesting indication of how it worked uh, in uh, actually at deployment at scale in a large scale MOOC. And uh, finally, uh, one of the things that intelligent tutoring systems tend to do is look at off task behavior. So how much of people's time is spent on task and how much of it is spent off task doing something else in the learning system. And what we find here is that uh, uh, several studies that have shown significant differences in how that off-task behavior happens in intelligent tutoring system. So in particular, um, there was significantly more off-task behavior in urban American areas than in rural or suburban. So showing again that this is not just, that, that this issue of cultural relevance is not just between countries, but might be uh, um, in, indicative of uh, differences in the ways that people with a particular background and a set of social norms um, engage in learning opportunities. Um, we also saw more off-task behavior with a system in the Philippines. Uh, Didith Rodrigo uh, ran a really interesting study looking at this. And so one of the things that this makes me do is question what we actually mean by off-task behavior. So what are these students doing and how do they actually engage in those learning opportunities? And I'll tell you a bit more about that later, but what we're seeing is that this has an impact on 
students' behaviors in a MOOC, or sorry, in an intelligent tutoring system, and in the ways that the models that underlie those systems can actually recognize what's happening. Okay, so we've seen that culture makes a difference in the ways that people engage in learning. And in particular, it does when we're talking about educational technology. So then the question becomes, what do we actually do about this? And here's the hard part. <laughs> um, how do we scale up these ideas? How do we think about how to actually, if we are not building one ed tech system for each individual learner around the world, how do we scale up the great stuff that's happening in educational technology such that it can help us solve those challenges we saw at the beginning of this talk? And here I have categorized people's approaches into five different uh, ways in which we might think about how uh, culturally relevant our technology can be. Uh, that is ground up design, parameterization, multiple versions, localized examples, and a purely technology focus. So I'm gonna walk us quickly through each one of these with some examples from some of my work. So um, ground up design uh, is about designing a system that specifically works for a very particular group. And this idea um, relates to that from Chen, who talked about designing for educational compatibility. That is the extent to which accepting a new system is congruent with the characteristics of a potential learner. And it's also supported by work done by Kumar in India, who showed that children's life paths vary substantially across gender, caste, and regional lines, and ed tech may need to be tailored to those individual situations in order to be effective. So in my work, um, I've done a lot of investigation and development in the Côte d'Ivoire, um, a country in West Africa, as you can see here on this map, um, where uh, my students and I, as well as a lot of local Ivorian researchers that we partner with and Ivorian ed tech companies as well, um, engage in rural regions in which cocoa farming is a primary occupation. Um, and so uh, you can see here uh, the, the cocoa chocolate, uh, it really smells very wonderful in these regions uh, as uh, learners and, and their families are engaged in, in agricultural work. Um, what we see as a challenge there is that there are 78 different languages spoken around the country. So languages that are not mutually intelligible. And yet French is the language of the school. And so learners are having to come to school and learn in a different, in a language that is almost uh, exclusively not the one that they speak at home. And so we work to design a system for literacy acquisition to help learners uh, engage better in French in schools. And one of the places that we started was there were no laptops around in the region, but in fact, there was 130% mobile adoption. So lots and lots of mobile phones in the region. But the majority were feature phones, so they were um, not uh, smartphones. They just have basic calling and SMS functionality. And so what we did here was over the course of three years with eight months spent by myself and my team in the field and many more by our local researcher partners, we ran a large set of design-based research studies where we looked at developing um, storyboards and prototypes through engagement uh, in a co-design process with our learners um, into actually doing piloting and system testing to where we improved the design and then actually at the end ran a, a randomized controlled study. Uh, and where we started there uh, was in just looking at what's happening in classrooms. So here's a picture from uh, these I rural Ivorian classrooms where students are learning with a teacher, we also were visiting uh, their homes. So here we have a blackboard that was present in a home where uh, students were learning uh, French uh, while they were out of school. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time engaged in uh, these, our uh, learners' lives before we started building anything. 
But once we did, we actually distributed a basic phone to each child, uh, even though there were mobile phones present in the homes, just to make sure that we had consistent system availability and a consistent user experience. We ran an enormous number of community support sessions. So this is one of my Ivorian partners on the left running a community support session for the parents and the kids on the right. Um, and uh, then we investigated what happened uh, in our pilot deployments to see uh, how learners engage. So what you see here is a student on the left with the mobile phone in his hand, and he's working through a paper notebook that he had in class. And he's now uh, using that to support him in learning on the phone with his mother and his siblings on the right hand side of uh, that photo. And what we learned from this deployment was that there were large networks of family members, neighbors, and community members that supported the learning process in this environment. So fam parents would recruit multiple family members. Uh, so you can see here from this quote, we go to the bush for field work. So the children are here with the big brother who's there to help. He helps them study before giving the exercises. Um, when they're there, they call the child and he reads a little with us, but oftentimes they were not there and they weren't able to support that learning process. But um, they had many people around who did. So here's another participant who said, I gave the phone to my child and I sat and watched him use it. At first, my son did not know how to use it. He did not understand. I did not know how. So I called my daughter who showed my son, here's what you have to do. So lots of family members around who were doing this support and they were supporting both with the system usage, so how to call in and use these uh, mobile phones to learn, but also with the literacy content. And so what you see here is yet a different type of family relationship. This is one of uh, the, the learners' aunts who is helping uh, the students to learn. And here it's actually while the learner is on the phone, up in the moment and the aunt is using one of those blackboards that you saw a minute ago in the home to actually help reinforce in um, uh, in writing what was happening verbally on the phone. And so the aunt is saying, you have to listen carefully. Which one is the right answer among these three words? So the aunt was structuring motivation, also scaffolding the actual learning process and giving explicit instruction for the interactive voice response and the French literacy skills uh, as they're sitting around engaging in this learning. And so what we see is uh, something you might call collective intermediation, that is mutual support and bootstrapped knowledge sharing. And so as I noted, uh, we've run uh, three huge studies over multiple years. Data analysis there is ongoing. But uh, one of the things that we found is that students who, who told us that they had any family support uh, have received at least a 10% boost in their outcomes with the system. And one of the mediators for that is just simply calling into the system more often. Um, I see co questions coming into the chat. I'll, uh, I think we can uh, get to them at the end, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, so in the end, we ended up building a whole support system for family members, which I'm happy to talk about as well. But because we saw such immense family support happening and that it wasn't specifically the parents, we had particular design features of this system that helped us out. Okay, so that's ground up design. We spent years and years building this one system for these set of communities in the rural uh, villages in Cote d'Ivoire with local partners. Uh, and it was incredibly uh, um, supportive of the particular practices that learners were in, but also enormously time consuming uh, to reach one small set of communities. And so we looked to maybe what are some other ways that uh, our proposals for thing scaling these things up. And the next one is parameterization. And that is looking at an ontology of cultural factors that might influence learning. And that is the system adapts based on some sort of cultural user profile. Um, that might be a, a country in some cases, or it might be other features of the learner's background that help us determine which 
um, parameters can be uh, changed in this system. And so one of the ways that we looked at this type of a system was with intelligent agents that can switch their dialect. And so uh, you can see a, a, a citation here uh, for Alex, a virtual peer that identifies student dialect. And so um, what we can tell here is that um, in, it is only in certain cases in which use of a home-based dialect can increase learning, and in only in some cases in which that dialect is preferred. And so you might actually need to do some determination uh, of the learner background and the situation in which it's being deployed in order to actually select the right approach for an educational technology to use. And so when we've been doing this work, what we find are that there are two major challenges for how we go about doing this. One is determining membership in a cultural group. So how do you actually tell who belongs to what group? Uh, and their proposals have ranged from thinking about the country of origin, which as you probably would say by now, that's not good enough. <laughs> uh, people have also looked at uh, what country someone grew up in, their adolescence country, what hobbies they engage in, how much education their family has had. So have their parents gone to high school, to college? Um, do they have uh, only a primary school education for influencing what type of group somebody might be a part of? What religion uh, are you a uh, part of might have a major impact on what groups you feel like you belong to? And what languages do you speak? And so here's an example system architecture from one such system that does this parameterization. But even when you figure out what uh, cultural group someone might belong to, uh, you then have to figure out what parameters of the system do you actually change? And so here are behind uh, are some examples of how you might actually change the cultural parameters. So it might be uh, about uh, emphasizing competition over collaboration, or the level of authority and hierarchy being seen from the instructor or from the authority figure in the system compared to a purely peer-based relationship. Uh, it might be about uh, individualized versus community-based learning, as we noted before. And so even once you figure out, does a person belong to just one group, uh, and how can we place them in this uh, in a bucket, then you have to figure out what about the interface do you change. And there are some interesting uh, results that have been seen uh, on a very um, uh, wide set of um, systems where people have actually looked at changing some of these cultural parameters and have seen positive impacts on learners uh, outcomes from these technologies. All right, multiple versions, the third uh, approach, is a little bit like parameterization, but, um, but maybe even a bit simpler. And so uh, some of my work looked at this approach by looking at individualized learning with intelligent tutoring systems. So here is a picture from an American classroom using an intelligent tutoring system. You can see they're sort of all focused on their own individual computer and doing their work uh, throughout the class period. Um, we also ran uh, students with the same technology, um, but with translations into additional languages um, to look at how they use the system. And so uh, what you see here is much more typical of my learners who were uh, in our studies in Mexico and Costa Rica and Chile, where you have, in this case, a group of three learners focused on one computer. And uh, by the end of the class, six learners working together where two learners were on the keyboard, one learner was on the mouse and the others were consulting uh, on how to solve the problems by the end of class. And so what started out as individual learning did not end up that way in this particular set of contexts. Um, interestingly, uh, here we have a, a photo from the Philippines where Didith Rodrigo was also deploying this, which is also a very um, collaborative and collectivist uh, location or context. And yet what they saw was students working primarily individually. 
And our hypothesis here was that there's a high um, power distance within the classroom in uh, these uh, Filipino classrooms in which um, the teacher really sets the tone and asks students to do everything individually uh, and students tend not to vary from what the teacher is requesting, which was not the case in our uh, classrooms in South America and Central America. So the proposal here for multiple versions takes that idea of parameterization but narrows it down such that you might only have a small set of, uh, of systems in which uh, those, system, the, those parameters vary. So you might have, for instance, only four versions of a system in which uh, things are done either at the group or individual level, and then it's either structured or self-directed. And so learners might just choose from which one of these four options they prefer, which can avoid the issue of, um, cultural group membership as students can make a decision about which one they prefer, but it, it, it allows you to do this uh, a lower level of um, cultural variation of the actual parameters in the system such that there's only these maybe four sets of, of uh, systems. Okay, and I'm, I know I'm plowing through these. I think um, we'll, we'll get to questions uh, in a minute. Um, uh, but I want to make sure we, we try to keep things on time. Uh, so I'll, so our fourth potential, uh, um, approach to culturally relevant technology is through engaging in localized examples. Uh, and this is where you might on the surface level just change the language that you're using, but also change the examples that your system uses for students to practice on. And so when we were taking our technologies around the globe into different environments, uh, they started out with mostly US based examples. And so here's one, if you're from the United States that you might be familiar with, a kid runs a lemonade stand and he sells more glasses of lemonade when it gets closer to 90 degrees, uh, which is a very hot temperature, and fewer glasses of lemonade when it's zero degrees or a very cold temperature. And as you can imagine, this example did not go over very well, for instance, in places where 90 degrees and zero degrees don't make any sense as temperatures because they are in Fahrenheit and not Celsius or perhaps where the temperature never varies much from 90 degrees uh, and where a lemonade stand is not a cultural artifact that people are used to engaging in. And so one of the things that we did was when we were running the study in Brazil, we changed the example to something that kids were actually doing, which was selling coconuts on the beach. Of course, the temperature still didn't make any sense, but you could uh, use a problem uh, feature in which they sold more coconuts on days with less rain and less coconuts on days with more rain. And so this was an example that made sense to the learners in this particular context. Another example that we had to change in our system was looking at how much dog food dogs ate depending on the brand. So did the dogs have a favorite brand of dog food? And when we took this system to Morocco, what we found was that there were generally not multiple brands of dog food that dogs could choose from, and maybe even none in lower income environments where dogs were fed just with table scraps or were um, or, or fended for themselves rather than the family going to the store and purchasing different brands of dog food for them. And so this was an example that we just had to cut and we found something else that we used entirely that didn't relate to this type of problem. So this is a very lightweight approach to globalizing your technology is to make sure that those examples fit the context. And then finally, uh, the last approach is a purely technology focus uh, in which you do something like the one laptop per child project and deliver only the technology and let the teachers and those in the local environment uh, work on the contextualization. So it's a hardware approach. Um, 
Jack Mostow and I were involved in a not, I won't say a similar approach because we worked very hard on making the, the software culturally relevant, but for the X the global X prize competition in which we were taking part, the general plan was to deliver a set of tablets uh, to environments where those tablets did not previously exist. So they were a newly introduced technology in which uh, the learners had to learn about the technology as well as then engaging in our software, which we um, worked on uh, making culturally relevant. But one of the things that we learned about a technology focus from this deployment was that even when we brought the tablets, we still had to uh, do a lot of localization. In this case, that meant uh, bringing solar panels so that we could help the uh, school charge all of these devices, even though in theory they had electricity at the school. We also, after several years in the environment, found that we needed to help them build a new building in order to uh, have the space and the security to deploy these tablets. So even when on the surface, you might think that you're deploying a hardware only solution. In the end, we found that it needed all sorts of support structures in order to even be viable. Okay, so these were examples of the five approaches to, uh, um, to the development of culturally relevant technology. As you can see here, um, they are organized in a particular way where um, the, those at the top have greater learner fit but those at the bottom have greater scalability and flexibility. And so these are one of the things that I've been working on in the last 10 years in my research is thinking about how to balance uh, these two features, learner fit, scalability, and flexibility. And of course, as you might imagine, uh, what we find is that there isn't really one answer to which of these are the right approach. Um, but that instead the solution depends on the specific context. So for instance, can you take a technology and change a set of examples and maybe at least it fits better into a neighboring town rather than having to redesign from ground up for that town? Or perhaps um, there's enough uh, expertise and experience in the environment uh, that local teachers can be responsible for doing a lot of the customization or do you really need to go into a community and help uh, them build their own relevant technology through a co-design process. Now, just to wrap things up here, um, over the years, I've heard a number of reasons why we shouldn't have to deal with the, this at all. Uh, for instance, um, the world is getting smaller, and so everyone's familiar with the same examples. Everyone knows baseball around the world, so we don't have to change an example that relates to baseball or that students must compete in a global context that happens to be dominated by weird norms. So they have to deal with weird countries anyway, so why not start when they're in school and let them deal with it there? Um, or that you know things are more available or more flexible than you think they are, and so um, we should allow people to just adapt uh, as, they, as need be. Or that designers are trained in certain worldviews, so they'll never be able to change th their approach. So those are reasons to overlook differences, but we've certainly found that culturally relevant technology is in fact critical. And that uh, on the left-hand side of this is what we always think of as the, the uh, features of an environment to engage with. So what is students' prior knowledge? What are the motivation for being there? What are the goals that they have? But in fact, that those motivation, goals, and prior knowledge uh, is very much impacted by their social identity, the students' practices, the values that they hold dear, and the ways that the, that motivation, goals, and prior knowledge is expressed uh, changes in sometimes radically uh, based on those uh, sociocultural features on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, is that culturally relevant technology critical? As we apply these things, we find that when you don't have culturally relevant technology, what you find is a boredom and lack of motivation from learners, a difficulty in comprehending the material. This actually can um, 
be a problem at a programmatic level. So you might have a loss of experienced staff or a failure of imported curricula when it's not culturally relevant. And on the other hand, studies on the positive side have found that cultural modeling uh, can gain two times the learning outcomes of traditionally taught students when you actually have a model of culture and you're able to deploy it. Okay, so what can we all do about it, even if you're not, you know, designing and delivering a technology for use in, in uh, cocoa farming regions of the Cote d'Ivoire? Well, we can raise awareness. When you're reporting on your studies or on your work, you can make your context explicit. So whenever I write papers, my students always want to put in the title something like in rural Cote d'Ivoire or in rural Tanzania or um, across uh, Mexico and Costa Rica. But we don't do this when we're talking about a study run in the United States or in Germany. And so making our context explicit, no matter where we're doing our work, can help normalize findings that come from a variety of places. And in fact, in your own work, you can seek out those from other contexts. So we don't have to rely only on, um, on, uh, uh, on work that's currently in the JLS that uh, comes from uh, US and European contexts. Beyond awareness, we can expand things. We can actually measure those contextual factors. So what really is the background of our learners and can we say more about it? Uh, can we do more replication studies that look at whether the effects we think are true are actually true around the world uh, and in different places? And then finally, uh, we can amplify things. We can build capacity in other places uh, to try to support um, more research from around the world being present in our favorite journals and conferences. We can partner with others. Uh, we've been doing a lot of this across Africa uh, with local researchers, companies, and others, foundations who are doing great work in these places uh, that may not be represented yet sufficiently in the literature and amplifying other voices. Uh, so representing work from around the world and um, making sure that we share it and talk about it. And uh, I just uh, sort of end here on that I've been recommended to actually take my um, chart from the beginning where I show the, the locations where I've been doing my work and flip it around to show it from a Southern Hemisphere point of view as one of those approaches to actually starting to break us out of some of our uh, culturally dominated thinking. And if we do that, uh, we can help uh, the efforts to build an implementation science for, oh, for, ah, sorry, for culturally relevant technology. Yes, there we go. These efforts will build an implementation science for culturally relevant technology enhanced learning. All right. And as I noted, there are so many people have contributed to all of this work beyond my own students at CMU and postdocs, but primarily uh, around the globe, millions of folks who have contributed enormously to um, making these types of research studies happen and to doing that awareness and capacity building, raising in, in uh, underrepresented locations in the learning sciences. All right, and I know you have lots of questions in the chat. <laughs> So, Paulo, should we just jump in there? Yep. Uh, I think we have a, a few minutes for questions, especially with overtime. Yes. So, um, I see, uh, let's see. Um, I think the first question is Ken at 506. Uh, I can read it, or maybe Ken can read it, or you can read it. <laughs> yes. Perhaps a little bit off topic, Amy. So you feel free to go to the next one if you want. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, let's see. I guess what I was, I was uh, the particular <laughs> prompt you showed on the screen was seemed like it was prompting for watching more lectures. I thought that was a little bit strange. 
<laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I'm definitely not um, supporting watching more lectures. So <laughs> I'll have to look at that one later. But maybe this question is important. How do we navigate situations where student choice and student learning outcomes are not well aligned? They choose one of working alone or in a group, but they actually learn better in the other. Yeah, so um, I think that's a really important question because we know that uh, students don't always make the best choices for themselves uh, in terms of their learning outcomes, but they may, might make the best choices for themselves in terms of motivation or alignment with other uh, social norms. And so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that we always go for what is the best thing for student learning outcomes, but rather that we have to find a balance. And that might include doing something like starting with student choice and nudging them towards um, the choices that might lead to better learning outcomes. Um, because uh, we know we lose students quickly uh, in environments where um, they are what that are not suited to their own. Um, I, I won't say learning style. That's a bad word. <laughs> um, uh, and so one of the things that we work to do that, that we spend a lot of time in thinking about in my work is where do we align with existing practices and where are we trying to change existing practices? Because, um, you know, we know that teachers and students themselves want better learning outcomes and they want to be happier while they're learning. And so guiding them and supporting them in ways that are not 100% natural might also be necessary. So I definitely wouldn't say that we should always just uh, cater to uh, student preferences, and yet they may still need an on-ramp uh, or alternative ways to get to where uh, we think they should go. Um, let's see. Uh, Hiba, uh, where's the content coming from? Is it aligned to the local curriculum or is the teacher providing instruction over the phone? So I think this was in reference to our system in the Cote d'Ivoire where we're deploying a French literacy intervention. Um, so that was a really interesting part of the story where we did two things. One was to work with the Ministry of Education to uh, align to their curriculum and they had to approve even at a lowest level the, the specific vocabulary words that we were using in the system. But we also designed a curriculum around some really important linguistic features and those were um, uh, we started out the curriculum with um, words and uh, phonemes that matched between French and the student's local language. So those should, in theory, be easier for the students to acquire because they're matching uh, uh, sounds that are already present for them in the home. And then the curriculum worked its way up to sounds that are only present in French and not in their local language. And so we had a very carefully designed progression within the curriculum from uh, what we thought were easier features of the language to more difficult features. But at the same time, we had to work very closely with the Ministry of Education to make sure that it'll, it aligned with their curriculum as well. So did you create the content or, or not really? Yes, we created the content uh, and um, with a uh, linguist uh, who was on our team from uh, Canada and with a sociocultural researcher who is Ivorian, so from the uh, local context. So the two of them uh, created the language curriculum. My team, who has more experience in uh, adaptive systems built out the system that uh, adapted the curriculum over time. And then we also engaged with the Ministry of Education to make sure it aligned with their curriculum. So it was a it was an effort by like five different partners to create this curriculum. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Sharon, which uh, 95 reference were you uh, I can maybe go back to that and think about it further. 
Oh, here, the cultural modeling students gain two times traditionally taught students. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, is, is that the, the uh, reference you were talking about? Is Sharon still here? I think Sharon might have left. Oh, she might have dropped off. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so technology has changed enormously since 95. Um, but uh, there aren't a lot of people doing these types of studies. So um, we don't, it, it's hard to update those references in some cases. Um, and I think there just needs to be more work done on how we can actually better support learners uh, across the globe. Uh, Sasha, you mentioned this in the multiple versions approach, but in general, how can we avoid disadvantaging people who might get located in the culture, but benefit more from a different approach? Uh, and potential for looking at all these different systems by our better approaches, including in weird uh, contexts. Oh yeah, the second one, I definitely agree with you there. So there are many um, features of the environment that we think we could bring back and uh, introduce uh, in the sort of the reverse direction, rather than imposing something in non-weird places, bringing things back to weird uh, locations. And one of those things is one that I presented here today, around family and community involvement. So I think our learners in the US would be, and of course they are in some uh, cultural groups in the US, uh, they, family and community is very much involved in schooling, um, but less so in other cultural groups in the US. And I think that would be one of those things uh, where we could uh, sort of work backwards, uh, you know, come talking about my personal standpoint, to uh, re-import things into a weird approach. Um, uh, avoid disadvantaging people who might get located in the culture but benefit more from a different approach. Yeah, so um, some of these approaches allow for student choice and others are uh, adapted to and chosen for the learner. And I think this relates to Ken's question where in my view, uh, one successful practice could be to um, create a balance between allowing learner choice and in supporting learners with a very specific um, uh, cultural, uh, culturally re relevant uh, set of parameters. So um, that we think both about what learners would like to do and uh, what they are um, prepared in the moment to do, uh, but also that we take into account uh, the evidence that we see from a system about what happens to their motivation and to their learning outcomes when they engage in that system. So we can still use a data-driven approach uh, to modify our system to account for those things, but I do think we should be aware of both students' uh, preferences as well as the background from which they come uh, in order to make that happen. Uh, Jack, was this what you were raising your hand for? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, so it's from a former uh, student of mine who's a PhD uh, robograph from Carnegie Mellon from Ghana, Ayoko Milstedi, who's now on the faculty at Arshesi University. A student of hers for project in her class um, did an experiment with Project Listen's reading tutor uh, in which uh, she hypothesized from the result of a study that she'd done before that low literacy kids might be having trouble because they didn't understand the prompts. Mm -hmm. So uh, Aoka was savvy enough that she was able to re-record the prompts in the local language. The student had three groups in a class. One of them was whatever the baseline was. One of them used the reading tutor off the shelf. One of them used the reading tutor with the prompts re-recorded uh, in the local language, which obviously is way easier than engineering the entire system. And uh, N, total N was 12, so it wasn't going to be significant, but the pattern of results was exactly what you'd hope for. That is, the gains were higher in the uh, localized version of the reading tutor than in the non-localized version, which are higher than the baseline. Um, there 
that's not the only system, but there's some parts that are easier to change. So that seems like the low hanging fruit for the future is build things that locals can uh, provide the stories for or, or customize in other ways. Yeah, I should definitely be citing that uh, paper, Jack, and thank you for reminding me of it. But I think that fits really well into that um, localized examples idea. So you have a system built, but you have people uh, who are embedded in the context who can adapt certain parts of it. So the structure might already be built, but they could record prompts or they could read stories or they could give examples. Uh, they could give hints and feedback that help um, learners from that context understand better. Um, I think it also fits in this final idea of amplification. So making sure that we're building capacity, uh, partnering and amplifying other voices. And I totally agree with you. It's a great direction to be able to allow that. Um, at the same time, we still may need to make sure that some of the other underlying architectures that aren't easily authorable from the end point of view are also accounting for those indigenous knowledges. And so that's where this capacity building may also be necessary. So, you know, can we partner with and help to support um, uh, voices that are underrepresented in understanding how to also, help, you know, build systems and, as well as doing the, the um, last mile work of, uh, you know, changing the examples and prompts. Great. Uh, Ken, what are your thoughts on another variation on the honor choice idea? Tell students about the research that suggests learning may be better by doing X than Y, uh, and then allow students to choose for themselves. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea, Ken. Uh, what you might need to do afterwards is show them some outcomes. <laughs> So is that actually true that the, the choice cool they made? possible? Yeah, right. When feasible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also be the so so that's a great idea. So guide them in, in a certain direction. But might you also then have the system be open to saying, actually, that didn't work for you. <laughs> and uh, and maybe this is something new that we've learned uh, uh, in the learning sciences that that for you, for these variety of reasons, hopefully reasons that we can detect and understand, uh, you know, that particular approach wasn't the better approach. And that could add to the learning science literature. Yeah, kind of hard to do on the individual level, though, because you don't have anything to compare against. Yes, it may take some more infrastructure or some ways to start, you know, identifying those uh, as, you know, individually as anecdotes or anomalies, but yeah, possibly yeah, yeah. aggregating them if you find enough of them. Right, right. Um, I'm a big fan of within subject or within participant experiments when, when feasible. So for example, if you have two ways to teach vocabulary, teach some words with one way and other words the other way and bank on uh, there not being too much transfer between from one word to another. Yeah, 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 that's great. So if you have a within subject experiment, then you have a better idea that the data or evidence that you find is actually has potential to be generalizable. Um, so yeah, that's nice. Um, I Sasha, think we have time you for... Oh, go yeah. ahead. One more question. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> Great. Go ahead. You think something like trying out each other's versions could be used additionally to promote intercultural awareness among students? I love that. Um, it reminds me of a game. I don't know if anyone has heard of it called Bangra that's intended to support uh, cultural awareness. And in it, two groups get trained with two different rules for the game, for the same game. And then they have to come play together and they're not told that they have different rules. And so um, they, uh, there's a lot of confusion that ensues before you realize that you're just playing the same game but with different rules. And that's what you were trained to do, you know, as part of your uh, 
you know, your, your life training. And so it causes really amazing conversations about uh, beliefs, values, norms, and practices. And so it would be really interesting to try something like that with an actual learning environment where you say, hey, like we, I did this and here's my learning environment. And here's how I felt while I used it. And here's how much I learned while I was using it. Uh, and why does yours look different? And uh, yeah, uh, I can see some really great discussion generated from that. All right, let's thank Amy again for the great presentation. And um, all right. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Yeah, and thanks for joining us. What's Thanks. next, Paulo? Thank you, Paulo, for <laughs> organizing. Thank Thanks, everybody. I got to run. Bye-bye.